what are you most excited for? And then they had an image there, which never specifically said in the copy Fallout 76. Though the, the gameplay screenshots are clearly from 76, and there's no other gameplay screenshots in there of games like Fallout 4 or any other hints or whatever it might be. Um, but they at least didn't specifically say Fallout 76. So I get to some extent, if some people just saw that and got a little bit confused and maybe set their expectations in the wrong place. Then there's this other post, which I think is the little bit more egregious one where it's posted from the Fallout account on October 20 slash 21. We're just three days away from the Fallout Day broadcast. What are you hoping to see during the stream? And the image there just says Fallout Day 2024, three days, and doesn't mention anything about Fallout 76. That is the one that I understand if people saw, they're like, oh, maybe they're gonna have some other surprises about the Fallout franchise as a whole. Maybe. I get that one more so. But all people had to do was do a little bit of extra research Click on that account, scroll down a little bit more, and you would have seen the initial post was about Fallout 76. And then not only that, after these two posts, they sent the other post that I referenced before, where they specifically clarified, no, it's just going to be about Fallout 76. Probably because people were getting so hyped about these posts. I saw people getting hyped about a post from the Bethesda Gear, Gear account about something big coming, and all it was was the giant Hogman plushie. Like, people were setting their <laughs> expectations in the wrong place, but all you had to do was a quick Google search or, or a search on the rest of the account to see what the Fallout Day was actually going to be about. And they quite explicitly said multiple times it was just going to be about Fallout 76. So again, even though there might have been some confusion with posts like these, that was the minority. They already announced that it was going to be for 76, and they clarified that it was just going to be about Fallout 76. So if you set your expectations wrong, about the Fallout Day broadcast. To be honest, that's on you. It's on you for getting hyped way too high and setting your expectations on the wrong spot. Because they were quite clear with it. They were quite clear with it. Aside from these two posts, with that, which they later clarified, if you still went into that Fallout Day live stream expecting a reveal of Fallout 5 or chat about Fallout 5 or a Fallout 3 remake, New Vegas remake, a spin-off from Obsidian, whatever it might be, if you went into there expecting that and got disappointed, that's on you. And also as well, it's absolutely on you to take that and then be so negative towards Bethesda and have this huge backlash against them. That is the type of criticism with regards to the Fallout Day livestream that I don't understand and I believe is completely unfair on Bethesda and unfounded. Now, there is a different type of criticism, as I alluded to, which I do believe is completely fair for people to have opinions on. Because if you were watching that live stream, knowing that it was 76 stuff, and you were disappointed by what was shown about 76 specifically, that's completely fine. Because I didn't like everything that was in there. That's a different type of criticism that I'm differentiating right now. So, why would people I be upset with what was shown for Fallout 76 in that stream? I'll get into it more in a second when I get into my opinions. But generally, there was a lot of stuff in that stream which we knew about already. We knew about playable ghouls. That was announced ages ago. We knew about the raid for Gleaming Depths. We knew about pets. We already knew about a lot of this stuff that they showed in that Fallout Day live stream. So when they rehashed what essentially was old information, I understand why people were upset by that. And they wanted to see more surprises and sneak previews and stuff like that. I will say, not everything that was shown in the Fallout Day live stream was known about. For instance, they did the tease for fishing. I don't believe they've ever talked about fishing in Fallout 76 before in the past. If they have, correct me in the comments below. I'll be 100% happy to admit that I was wrong on that. But I think fishing was a genuine surprise and tease. So that was good. But everything else, they pretty much announced before, and I can understand why people were a little bit upset and disappointed by that. But I will say though, to counter it, again, I'm trying to be as fair as possible here, at least they showed off a lot of this stuff in more detail. Hello there, couriers and courierettes. During the Fallout Day Bethesda livestream, they primarily spoke about all the additions they would be adding to Fallout 76 in the coming years, like the upcoming Enclave Dungeon Raid and the possibility of becoming raid. a ghoul. Most of this stuff we already knew, but as their stream was ending, this man said he was doing research on an upcoming feature while holding a fishing rod in his hand. Do you think they will be adding some form of fishing mini game to fall out? Like they did in Skyrim? Yeah, I think so. The one they stole from the modders? Yeah. And subscribe for more short Fallout news videos. Your voice was very weird. Why? And making you excited to, to come into this. So have you been playing anything that's been kind of lighting your fire? 
excited to, to come into the studio and get to work. I mean, it sounds weird, but like I'm enjoying playing Shattered Space. I obviously <laughs> no, Todd. That doesn't sound weird at all. I mean, who wouldn't want to play Shattered Space? Especially since Starfield is actually good now. It's more immersive than it's ever been. Wake up! Wake up! <laughs> they polished out all the jank. Is something amiss? <laughs> and the game runs like a dream. I think when it comes to world building, it's having that believability that this exists. And with games, it's it's putting you in that world and having it react to you, <laughs> having it pique your curiosity. What? Why did she do that? When you have this curiosity for what's over that hill, that the game rewards it. Is that it up here? I don't think Bethesda are as concerned as they should be. I think that they think that everything's going to eventually work out. That Starfield is going to somehow maintain a slow and steady growth and eventually be redeemed like Fallout 76. People play their games for longer. The top 10 played games for 2023, the average age of those games was six years old. Wow. Um, Fallout 76 is now six years old. The only new game, I think, in that list was Starfield. I'm not so sure people are going to be playing Starfield six years from now, seeing as how less than 1% of their player base has even initiated the first quest step for the new expansion. Which is a shame. Those poor suckers are really missing out on a lot of cool new content, like the new redeemed enemy type. It's a berserker variant that charges at you with the ferocity of a thousand suns. Let's see what else is new. Recently, we've started implementing a sponsorship system into our games. You'll notice this with Factor, which is the sponsor of the day. Factor has a lot of variety. They've got 35 meals to choose from. It has 16 times the choice when compared to a standard refrigerator. Ranging from Gourmet Plus, Keto, Vegan and Veggie, and even Calorie Plus if you're looking to slim down. Like I said, there's a lot of options. Romano Shredded Chicken. Everybody loves Romano. They also offer smoothies and protein shakes with over six the add-ons to keep you fueled and focused. Hey buddy, are you hungry? Here. <laughs> yeah, it's good, huh? Want some more? I've actually gotten factor before getting this sponsorship, and I thought it was convenient having pre-made meals that I only had to throw into the microwave, and that allowed me to continue gaming without having to leave the house. And if you want to talk about convenience, factor ships right to your door. So head to factor75.com and click the link below and use code RENSREVIEW50 to get 50% off your first factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. So delicious. Yeah. You can't get enough of it. Again, that's RENSREVIEW50 at factor75.com, and that'll get you 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. The best part about Factor is it just works. Now let's get back to the video. Food. Food. Now, before I could even start playing the expansion, I had to reacquaint myself with the game. And as I was doing that, I heard a familiar voice. Yes, we've all seen everything. <laughs> now put your clothes back on. Oh, it's you. Some of you might remember in my last Starfield video, I spent hours tricking Sarah into marrying me, only to immediately abandon her on the very planet that she was stranded on for two years. And now, after all that I've done to her, I struggle to look Sarah in the eye. Because somehow, like the fool she is, she can still find it in her heart to love me. You're my soulmate. We were meant to be together. So I thought it would be best for us both to try to end things right there on the spot. But I couldn't stand the idea of hurting her like that. My heart feels like it's been ripped. My god, she was ugly. My body. <laughs> so I changed my mind. You have no idea how relieved I am that you feel that way. In a few uh, moments later, back to the lock with you, Nessie. I met Andresia. Oh my goodness! Seeing her made me realize that if I'm playing an expansion, I want to do it with someone who makes me expand. As a person, I want an experience that is fresh and new, not old and blonde. And you know what? I want to share that experience with someone who has hands that aren't so... freaky. Then it's over. Now, I'm going to need some time to myself.
And so, as I was on my way to start playing the new co content with my new girlfriend at my side, somebody stopped. I don't like this. Go to unsub. <laughs> don't recommend this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> See, it, is, uh, it took a Hello little... there, couriers and courierettes. During the Fallout Day Bethesda live stream, they uh, primarily uh, spoke about uh, all the additions go back. they would... Uh, this guy did a video about this. They got 3,000 views. So they listened to him. How is it about to change forever? It's not. The Fallout TV show propelled Fallout to its best year in. Thank you, Norza. Years. I've liked this up to your channel. Never Fallout seen him before. Update, but also multiple large updates to Fallout 76. After the Fallout Day broadcast, I got to sit down with John Rush, the creative director. Oh, yeah? And the lead producer from cool. Bethesda Game Studio to talk about Fallout 76 and its future. Nice. Hey, we're, uh, you know, we're from the horse's Fallout mouth. That's good. News that it did bring. So the big change here that we got a lot of new information about is the playable ghouls. And the gameplay mechanics as well as the lore implications that it does also bring. Being able to change from a human to a ghoul by something other than the bombs falling is almost entirely new to the Fallout lore, but it's definitely new to us. This isn't simply a cosmetic change either, it'll also drastically change the way you play. Ghouls are immune to radiation for one, so radiation damage actually heals you instead and feels what's called a glow bar, more on that in the interview as well. There's no hunger or thirst, instead you have a feral meter, this will need to be managed as positive and negative effects on how feral you are. There's also new HUD elements to reflect these changes, like removing the hunger and thirst at the feral meter, also Ugh, radiation. Why? There's a ton of new perk cards. Now, during my interview, John mentioned perk cards are cool. 30 new perk cards. 30 perk cards. Several examples for ones that we didn't actually get to see in the broadcast. So, without further ado, let's jump into that interview. And I do highly recommend you do watch the Friday broadcast as well, as like a companion piece to this, because I will be covering things in that interview that I haven't directly spoken about here like the gleaming death ray the new camp pets as well as the upcoming fishing mechanic that was teased in the broadcast but let's get into it very honored to sit down with why so many you john Rush, why the director and bill lacoste the lead producer why to the to talk about the fallout day broadcast that we just watched so thank you both for joining me and i'm curious to know what time it is you guys first it is 4 30. nice it is 8 31 in the morning it's hard, you know, we're, we, uh, especially to book a time like this where we can both communicate that it's not 1am in the morning for one of us. <laughs> so starting off with the, with the first uh, question for you guys, the we saw a beautiful graphic throughout the All That Day broadcast that showed all the updates that Fallout 76 has received. It really puts in perspective that the journey the game has been through. I was wondering for you both, uh, what is your favourite update? What's resonated with, with each of you? Starting with John. Did you put music in the background of it? Sure, so uh, I'll go back a little further uh, and kind of touch on the initial launch of 76, right? Um, I'd always felt that there was, I'd always looked at that as kind of like, uh, like chapter one in the story of Appalachia, right? And so it was kind of a, a poetic element to coming out of a vault and seeing like nobody, mm -hmm. really. there's nobody there. Uh, nobody, phys nobody physically there, mm -hmm. right? Getting acclimated to that, getting used to the main character of the game, I've always said that's Appalachia, accustomed to Appalachia. Uh, I would say my favorite update would probably be Wasteland, which I view as the next chapter in that story, where people from, if this is the map, people from You mean the only update? One a time I'm kidding. Skyline was real. Back to West Virginia Skyline was good. Reason. I'm going to, to there on base on uh, Dwar Must Die, uh, new names and faces all together. but uh, it's a so long walk, really, uh, really kind of changed the whole and I didn't cheat. It's not custom, so I've, I have to prepare to make the journey. With Appalachia gave us uh, storytellers more tools to play with, or, or wider variety, color of crayons, or whatever uh, metaphor we want to use, but uh, I'll go with uh, Wastelanders. Yep. Yeah, so I share a lot of the same thoughts that John has. Um, you know, I do have some of the 
you know, more fun and uh, updates that I really enjoy, like Invaders from Beyond, Still Rain, Still Dawn, and obviously the most uh, recent Skyline Valley, you know, have been really good updates, but it really does start with Wastelanders for me, uh, being the primary one, because as John said, you know, it really just kind of, kind of set the stage for all of our future updates at that point, having NPCs and a little bit more life uh, coming into the, the region, um, you know, really kind of set us up um, to, to be where we are now, so, yeah. Absolutely, Wastelanders was one of my favorite updates it was definitely when i became more addicted to the game but uh, still rain for me is, is my favorite um camp pets is very exciting um my partner who loves animals is very very excited for camp pets but will they be treated the same as allies in the game do they have any gameplay benefits or can they follow you like a traditional all that companion they'll follow you around your camp uh like a like a companion there's also unique commands that you can give uh, your pets and we'll always come out with new commands down the road pet pet your pet uh which is which is a good one um they'll also occasionally bring some stuff back to you they'll go out go out and fetch some things um one another unique uh, aspect of the camp pets that kind of differentiates them from allies a bit more is that we have uh, this camp pet furniture right so for instance if you get a cat uh, you can place a cat scratch post in your camp and anytime the cat kind of walks by the scratch post it'll stop and start doing the, the scratching so there's any number of those that we can come up with uh, any number of those that you can place in your camp to really give it more life give your pets more character uh with the release of the fallout tv show uh you guys released some themed builds for the main characters from the show now with playable ghouls coming to fallout 76 which of the new ghoul perks do you think Ghoul having that purple What do you think, Bill? I could start, man. Faulty spots for one because uh, mm. you'll basically get a 30% increase in damage to weak points, um, which is a really good deal for you. Um, uh, last one uh, for you both. Uh, I'm really fishing for information here, but uh, John, you, you teased a new exciting feature in the broadcast. Uh, what sort of irradiated fish or other species could we expect to see in the game? Are they collectible? Is there any gameplay benefits? Anything you could add? Uh, yeah, so, as he's in the fall of the broadcast, fishing is coming to Appalachia, wherever you can, you know, reach down and drink some water, you can fish there too. So, looking at the map, picturing all the possibilities, there's a lot of places to fish and explore yeah, and experiment ah. to see what unique types of fish uh, that you can pull from those different regions and different bodies of water. Uh, getting into specifics about which specific fish you're going to pull out, you know, uh, being a Fallout fan, I'm, sh I'm sure that you can probably picture half a dozen uh, right off right off the top of your head, so I don't want to get into too many specifics, but we will have new cooking recipes and whatnot to, to go with those and, and new challenges and, and the whole deal. It's going to be a great update. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I'm Definitely keen for fishing. It's one of my favorite things to do in games is that it might be a little less serene in a fallout environment. But I'm excited for that. Hopefully I can blow up a mile of aggressive. Uh, maybe. I, I had one I had one other note for you. You know, you, yeah. you mentioned about you know feral ghouls in the game and how they react to the player. Um, you know, one other element of this too is that there's gonna be other factions in the game that are now hostile to your player because you are a ghoul. Um, and so, oh, uh, play, okay. Brother to Steel, for example, will be a couple of those factions. Um, but, um, you know, search around and you may, you may find some creative and unique ways to be able to bypass uh, some of that and still get around. You mean, like, talk to an NPC? Yeah, I was interested no. in that as well. Um, is there anything that you can sort of expand on there? Oh, Maybe, go. You know, or a Farshnot mask, okay. even something to, to hide the look? New build, new build, quick. Go. <laughs> Uh, perfect. Thank you guys for your time. I appreciate you taking the time out of your end of your day. Uh, but that's all the questions I have. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Thank you for your continued support and encouragement. Um, it's great. I love getting to talk to folks who are huge fans of BGS, uh, huge fans of, of Fallout 76. So thank you for your time. Uh, I hope we get to do this soon. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and thank you again for celebrating Fallout Day with us. Uh, you know, we, we celebrate this every year, of course, and we enjoy it. Uh, getting on streams and watching all the players and how they interact on Fallout Day. And, um, it's really amazing. Welcome request thank accepted. You thank you for celebrating Fallout Day with us. And play Fallout 76 for free until October 29th. Nice. It's, it's free for like 10 days, huh? Oh boy, I guess we're doing this.
I've tried to do my best to navigate the waters of social sensitivity, but there is so much intellectual dishonesty on both sides of the aisle that very little progress is ever made, and oftentimes, genuine criticism is lost in translation. DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, has very much become the boogeyman that is haunting the video game industry, slowly eroding our trust and interest in a lot of games. And it's penetrated discussions around the quality of games, character designs, narratives, heck, even how we play games in the first place. And these are all valid criticisms to make because at the end of the day, we're buying a video game, not a social manifesto. I want more people to feel like they belong because they do belong. From my perspective, regardless of your nationality, gender, or identity, you're a gamer in my eyes. This isn't about not wanting people in games. This is about being sick and tired of watching companies commoditize people's identities and then go and use them as a shield for bad products. I'm sick of it. While social responsibility and representation is important, at the end of the day, the transaction that's happening is for engagement, entertainment, and enjoyment, and that's being lost. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk about the real... Um, I don't think so. I'm sure you did something good at some point that I liked, but I don't oh boy, I guess think you're this. my style. You kind of popped in there. Trump, Trump crypto coin is really fucking fun. Oh, no. Yay, didn't you already do this video? But I like Jimmy the Giant, yep. Gila Klein is a terrorist? Oh no. Oh my god. Making peace with Fallout 4. That might be good. Let's do that. <laughs> we'll do how I escaped the alt-right pipeline. I don't have that concern. I would never fucking be in the same room as, as a right winger. Let's put it that way. And uh, but a little, uh, I do really like Jimmy the Giant because he is funny. Once a Republican, always a Republican, though. Aside from the initial schism between fans of the isometric games and the 3D games, perhaps the sharpest divide in the Fallout fandom is between those who prize Fallout New Vegas and those who favor Fallout 4. I'm very much in the former camp. I was primed to love Fallout 4, still being a newly minted fan of both the series and Bethesda Softworks after my initial introduction to both with Fallout 3. 2008 to 2011 were golden years, with Fallout 3, New Vegas, and Skyrim, the latter two being masterpieces of the simulational open world RPG format. Fallout 4 was supposed to easily be my game of the year, and there was every chance it would become one of my favorite games ever. But as I played more and more of it, that passion failed to materialize. Yeah, that was my Fallout response to a lot of obvious improvements. But it was also it's weird because I love 76, but I don't like Fallout Studio 4. Studio director Todd Howard has said that Bethesda aims to make each game different, and because of that, it's understandable why players would have strong preferences for which are their favorites. To me, Fallout is about open-ended narrative role-playing in a fantastically inventive and engaging setting. Fallout 4 has a different set of design priorities from the kind of games that brought me into the franchise. That's not a bad thing by itself, even if it personally pushes me away from the experience. It does me no good as a player or critic to stamp my foot and demand that it be more like New Vegas, when that's probably never what they were going for. It's been many years since my initial playthrough of the game and its DLC add-ons. My hype for the game and subsequent disappointment is distant in the rear view. I know what kind of game Fallout 4 turned out to be. I've never been one to say that it was an outright bad game, but it was absolutely a disappointing one. Like a lot of people, the surprisingly good TV adaptation <coughs> just how much I enjoy the Fallout universe and got me back into playing the games. Fallout 4, almost 10 years old at this point, is still the latest mainline entry in the franchise. I'm not discounting Fallout 76, but it's a live service online game, and those design priorities make it fundamentally a different beast. So Fallout 4 is still the most modern and most accessible of the franchise. 
my motivation is high for coming back to reevaluate the game and try to find some more redeeming qualities than I did the first time. The question it was a tiny is, game. Can I return to Fallout 4 and reevaluate it for what it is instead of what it's not? Can I learn to better appreciate the game's unique strengths without getting too caught up in the places it stumbles? I'm sorry to say that in this instance, I have to be mean before I can be nice. Fallout 4 doesn't make it easy to overlook its biggest flaw. A lot of effort went into the polished and cinematic intro. There's an impressive montage of live action footage and a fully playable pre-war sequence. It makes you think that Fallout 4 is going to be a game with lots of highly produced moments like these. A game that values story more than past games because it has a great story to tell. And that's not the case. Parts of it are more produced, certainly. But this initial impression ignores huge swaths of the Fallout 4 experience and directs your attention toward one of the weakest elements, the writing. What it boils down to is that Fallout 4 tells a worse story in a slightly flashier way, and it doesn't help that its immediate predecessor was so much better in that regard. In release order, you go from one of the best written games in the series to one of the worst. Bad writing smacks you in the face early and often. In theory, seeing the pre-war world is a novel expansion of the Fallout canon. It worked incredibly well in the TV series as a means of building character, plot, and background for the show. But the game's pre-war sequence is so cartoonishly paced that it's hard to invest in or take as seriously as intended. The vault tech rep shows up at your door minutes before the bombs start falling. Somehow your paperwork is immediately processed and you're waved through the security checkpoint, making your way underground just as the shockwave from the first bomb sweeps over. It's a little too melodramatic. The direction and pacing let down what's otherwise a fairly effective scene. Hearing about the start of the war on TV, followed by the sirens, the panic, and sudden flurry of military activity, is all really sobering. But overall, the sequence is too compressed to allow for much exploration of the pre-war world or function effectively as an interactive cinematic. When you return to your old neighborhood after spending 200 years in cryogenic storage, the faithful family robot is still there waiting outside your house. It's a Fallout 4 it's review. I don't want it. Nonsense in Fallout. It's a series that incorporates blatantly fantastical ideas as part of its retro future sci-fi aesthetic. But there's a big difference between diverging from real-world science and ignoring basic logic so that your own setting is called into question. This is the latter. Codsworth waiting for you at your old house like Philip Fry's dog only harms the game from a narrative and world-building perspective. It tells the player that the war was not as big a deal as they might think. Instead of coming back to your old neighborhood and finding only ruins, or even no trace at all of your old life, the profound sense of loss and change is undercut by coming home to find the old family dog waiting for you. What war? What apocalypse? What two centuries? 200 years is a long, long time for nothing at all to have happened to a valuable piece of technology. It didn't break down, it wasn't stolen or destroyed, it wasn't moved elsewhere. And right away, cracks start forming in the blue. <coughs> Is this a big deal? I mean, no, not by itself, but it's indicative of the sort of considered writing that you get far too often throughout the game. So many story elements feel like they take place in a vacuum, separated from the rest of the world by contrivance, or no explanation at all. Another, more egregious example is the infamous Kid in a Fridge side quest, where you come across a ghoul child who's been trapped in a refrigerator since the bombs fell. That alone is pretty unbelievable, because it stretches our innate sense of human nature well beyond the breaking point. The kid's been in solitary confinement for 200 years. I don't care that he's a ghoul. He would be out of his mind, overwhelmed by reintroduction to the world. This is a bad starting point for the quest, but it stubbornly refuses to get any better. The kid wants to look for his parents. You can sensibly explain to him that they're obviously long dead, though he insists on returning home anyway. If you take him, you'll find the house intact, and his parents, 
now also ghouls, inside waiting for him, standing side by side like a Norman Rockwell painting. It's so stupid, and it's not played for laughs, or irony, or anything. Like Codsworth, they've stayed in the same place for 200 years, despite the bombs, despite the difficulties of the post-nuclear world. They've lived multiple lifetimes since the Great War, but they act like their son has been missing a week. But it gets worse. The family's house is in the town of Quincy, which has been recently taken over by raiders. One of these raiders will stop you on the way and offer to buy the ghoul kid from you. Ghouls, he says, make good slaves because they're immune to radiation, don't age, and don't need to eat. In his words, you can work them real hard. This makes it so much more implausible that the kid's parents would still be living there. Why didn't they flee when the raiders took over? Why weren't they captured and enslaved? If they're still in town, they should at least be hiding. This quest is written with little to no regard for how its plot beats mesh with the other established parts of the setting. And in this nice, case, I got a new it shield. Doesn't even make sense with the other parts of the nice, setting. I like it. It's good. If the game itself isn't taking the fiction seriously, if it isn't bothering nice new amulet. basic logic and reasoning, then why should the player care? Compare these two examples to Cooper, the ghoul from the Fallout TV show. The events Harvesting hat happened since have changed him profoundly. He's not still performing at children's birthday parties or acting in films in the post-apocalypse. He's become a wasteland survivor. Cooper is a dynamic character with depth who reacts to his environment and has an inner life, not just a sad backstory. If Cooper was a Fallout 4 character, he'd probably send you on a fetch quest to collect his old movie memorabilia, and that would be about the extent of it. I wanted to care about the world of Fallout 4, the story of Fallout 4, but over and over, in big and small ways, that investment was discouraged by this kind of lax attitude towards consistent and sensible world building. These are some particularly egregious, obvious examples of the game's bad writing. Really, there's more bland than bad writing in the game. I'm not going to talk about the main plot in depth. Like most Bethesda games, the central questline is far from the most interesting part. In some ways, it adapts a vaguely similar structure to New Vegas. There's a kind of linear first act, then the mid-game introduces several opposing factions, and the final act makes you commit to a mutually exclusive choice. That's not unique to New Vegas, but what that game does so well is use that structure as a framework for helping players learn about the world and then make informed, meaningful, and consequential choices within it. Most of the dialogue within PCs, whether significant or incidental, do at least a little bit to advance the world building and enlighten the player. It does an impeccable job of accounting for a wide variety of player choice, including the choice to bypass, ignore, or shortcut major plot points. You can kill any adult NPCs in New Vegas, and the game will allow it and keep functioning. By contrast, Fallout 4 is too precious about its characters and set pieces to allow you to miss them or choose to engage with the content too differently. That puts more pressure on them to be good, pressure they're mostly not able to withstand. It's a much more linear and inflexible version of the same basic structure. The constituent quests don't offer much- At least he didn't break down the fucking story. Outside the purely mechanical. If you want to advance the main- I don't need that again. certain hoops you're going to have to jump through in certain ways. To be fair, the third act lets the leash out a bit, allowing greater freedom and substantial consequence as you decide which faction to side with. But it's too little, too late. The bulk of the main quest line is still a narrow, linear slog. To put it in a nutshell, in New Vegas, you collaborate with the game to craft a character and a story. In Fallout 4, those things are dictated to you, but you get to pick the ending. This has more in common with narrative adventure games, where the story is broadly linear and has the same basic shape no matter what actions you take. That approach can work well. Telltale made a whole niche genre out of that style, and some of those games are classics. But their smaller, tighter scopes conferred other benefits that Fallout 4 Warp doesn't have, active. like better control over tone and pacing. 
Generally speaking, the writing and plotting of those games is well above the standard achieved here. There are good companions, quests, concepts, and ideas in the game, but the good stuff is inconsistent and unevenly distributed. Where there should be more dialogue, more character, there is only more combat and more ruins. But then again, when Fallout 4 starts talking, sometimes it really makes you wish you were shooting something instead. Yeah. Everything about the main plot and side quests is made worse by the unforced error of the revised dialogue system. A dialogue system isn't just a way to disguise menu selections or make exposition more interactive. 60 BST with it's a playtime of 180 hours. Giving players you still the opportunity died. to voice their feelings and opinions is crucial for immersion and role playing. Without that, the game's 184 dialogue is hours. to the player. It speaks at you, not with you. Fallout 4 changes how dialogue is delivered, how dialogue is chosen, and how dialogue is presented. For the first time in the series, the player character is voiced. Dialogue is chosen from a four-way menu rather than a variable list of options. And the unnatural... It just sounds like a bunch of complaints now. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't like Fallout 4. Not, like, I don't know. This was good, but I don't, didn't really like it. Yeah, yeah, play that one. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Yes, 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 my brothers, my my brodies, my wodies. I'm going to do another one of these little talk to cams. You might have noticed, you know, through some of my videos, I officially joined the Woke Brigade. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to. But I'm going to talk how we got here. My political arc has been pretty insane. At yeah. one point, I was in a Nico a a Malama video supporting Trump. That's me. Ugh. I'll admit it. Blurry boy. Trommy Reporters UK. I'm here. Look at my hat. I love Donald Trump. So today we're going to talk Ugh. about how I managed to escape the alt-right pipeline. Up yours, woke moralists. How Sorry. many of you students? 200,000 <laughs> population. And how many was? 45. Yeah. There will never be peace on this earth so long as we have this book. It's a violent and Woke moralists. Attacks on mosque. Other minority communities singled out. Wanton violence alongside racist rhetoric. When I was a young gangster, a YG, I was a little, a little bruh, right? A little bruh, I'm about 13 years old. And we're invited into school. It was mandatory, we weren't invited. And we had to do a speech. So, you know, my mate goes up and he does the history of Chelsea Football Club. A girl goes up and she does about horse riding. I go up with my little thumb drive, plug it in, 9-11. So I basically proceed <laughs> to analyze a classroom of young impressions. <laughs> Yes, uh, yeah. Cool, 13 year olds as to why the American government did 9 11. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe, uh, you know. I believe was behind 9 11. Criminal. Uh, criminals. Cri uh, you know, Dick Cheney, George Bush Jr., the deep state, if you believe in such things, I kind of don't lately. Like, I'm, I kind of doubt they have the, the organization that I used to think that they had. Back in the years 2000, I thought they were actually competent. Now, after 20 years, I don't think the deep state exists, and I don't think they're competent. So the military and I think it's just greed and fear and, and control. Special complex, the same ones... And I don't know why they, well, I know why they bombed, uh, they, I, I mean, I can tell you why they, 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 uh, detonate or well, they, uh, they imploded, uh, uh, you know, the towers in nine 11, it was to get us to go to war overseas and in forever war with Afghanistan for 20 years so we can have oil. And this isn't just my, my conviction. This is what most people think. That stage Gulf of Tonkin. The same now, I mean, I'm not saying most people think that 9/11 was an inside job. I'm saying that we we were. I'm saying that a lot of us know that we went over there tonight to uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and and all these places because because of oil. That's a wisdom America used to be able to have freely without having to make some kind of tribalist association. It used to be that both sides could admit that we went over to the Middle East because of oil. Now I think the tribalism, I think that maybe the right-wingers might not like me saying that. 
But it used to be cool for both sides and even progressives to say that. Same ones that staged Operation, right. the mass shootings of Operation right. Gladio. Right. Ooh, Do you I was that? in this kind of like early conspiracy theory bubble. But what I want to say is it was interesting, right? Because at that time, being a conspiracy theorist wasn't left and right. It was just anti-establishment. And so whilst I was listening to Alex Jones, I'd also be listening to the Young Turks and listening about Occupy Wall Street. So when I was young, I was just a sort of contrarian hipster. I'm not like a communist, but I'm definitely not a capitalist. And I'm, I'm definitely left wing. And I definitely voted to remain in the EU referendum. And so time goes by, I grow up. Yeah, me too. I, I remember- I, I didn't like Brexit. I had a few jobs working like fucking Sainsbury's or B&Q. And that was further fueling my sort of anti-capitalist feelings. But I remember I got one job and I met this geezer and he was a proper right winger. Capitalism is good because capitalism is freedom. Socialism is bad because socialism is tyranny. It was like a right winger in the flesh. I'd never seen one before. I was like, what the fuck hell is this? Capitalism good? Welfare state bad? NHS bad? But you see, although I deeply disagreed with all of his views at the beginning, you gotta remember 13 year old contrarian Jimmy. He's still in there somewhere. And what he's hearing is contrarian views, you say. Anti-establishment, non-mainstream, little old hipster Jimmy lapped up this sort of rock <coughs> because, because I realized it was different to everyone else and that would make me interesting if I believed all these things, right? And like, when I say right wing, it's not, nope. you know, we don't like foreigners, it's stuff like this. The people who get on welfare lose their human independence and feeling of dignity. They become subject to the dictates and whims of their welfare supervisor who can tell them whether they can live here or there, whether they may put in a telephone, what they may do with their lives. They're treated like children. So now I'm at the doors. It's true. The light pipeline, right? I pick up my, that is my true. with the light, turn the torch on, grab my pickaxe, and I head in. And the first stop I'm gonna pull is... this cord now because it's driving me fucking crazy. Wait, oh, did you pause? Yeah, you paused now. Jordan Peterson. And then if I'd said to you, please, Fuck Jordan, Jordan Chief, Peterson. Uh, how would you respond to that on a personal level? How, how would you the way I have responded to that, because I've had a number of conversations with transgendered individuals, is that I use whatever pronoun seems to go along with the persona that they're projecting publicly. How can I describe the fact that someone who was once a woman, and really still is, had her breasts cut off because she, he, they, their, them, had fallen prey to a viciously harmful fad. So bear in mind, I didn't go to university. I went and just tried to make little businesses. I did a parkour brand. I ran a vegan food store. I did lots of little things. And very importantly, I was not academic. Jordan Peterson, so young Jimmy, sounded like how I imagine smart people sound. So even if you do happen to be that avatar of moral purity that you claim implicitly, the probability that you get to act out your goodness in relationship to those possessed by your ideology is zero. He would use big words, he would do this with his hands, he would think and contemplate, like he was- Except he just person. mispronounced the word ideology it, like an idiot. He just <laughs> mispronounced the word ideology. I've never in my life heard it said ideology except by this idiot. Idiot, idiot. Mature of a smart person. But you can go about and, and say ideology. Like what? Very interesting because all of his views tended to be quite contrarian to sort of mainstream views. And he would again, like my friend, he would talk about the benefits of capitalism. He would talk about natural hierarchies and that it wasn't capitalism's fault for hierarchies, but hierarchies are natural. And so it's very interesting because if you think about what Jordan Peterson is and what he thinks and his words now, back in 2016, it was very different, right? As a matter of respect and fact, would you refer to a trans person who asks you to use they them pronouns a pronoun which has a several not hundred year historical but that's not what we're talking about he rises to fame on what he is portraying as a free speech battle the canadian government are trying to make it so that if you say the wrong pronouns to a transgender person you will go to jail and jordan peterson never says something like i don't believe in trans people and so i don't believe i should say their pronouns he's not saying that people who do transgender surgeries are butchers he is saying that by law, I shouldn't be forced to say anything. Difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. 
As I grew up, I kind of realized he misrepresented this bill and he was blowing things out of proportion. But if we just take it on face value and believe what he was saying, then yeah, it seemed illogical to oppose what he was saying. And so whilst I'm going through Jordan Peterson's books, his podcasts, his speeches, etc., I'm getting this feeling that there's this sort of crazy indoctrinated Marxist left who are trying to suppress your freedom and usher in communism. And so all this is happening all the way in Canada and I won't give a fuck about it. But what about here in Britain, right? In Britain, we have a sort of similar scenario and it involves a man, a very controversial man by the name of Tommy Robinson. Mm -hmm. And before we go any further, I want to give a massive shout out to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is undoubtedly the best, I'm not kidding, the best platform when it comes to making websites. Beautiful websites, ones that are perfectly tailored to you. With their new design intelligence, which combines the newest AI technology, plus their years of understanding and crafting beautiful website templates, you can now literally type in prompts to the AI and it will create a bespoke website to you and your brand. As well as that, their payment system. So if you're but if you're selling goods online and people maybe you have customers all around the world Squarespace takes so many different types of payments it's now easier than ever from Klarna to ACH direct debit Apple pay and you can even do buy now pay later with Afterpay and Clearpay and also the laborious job of writing product descriptions got a whole world easier with Squarespace's blueprint AI you can just bang in a prompt it'll shoot out some text you can tweak it and change it and it's really it will save you time and it's very good quality so be sure to head over to squarespace.com forward slash Jimmy the Giant and to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, use the code Jimmy the Giant. Anyway, back to the video. This, the book, around in this, book is the reason, this book is, is the reason this book is the reason we are in such a mess. Boys, I'm not this isn't I'm not proud of this, but I'm just being an honest person. I'm trying to explain where I was at, how I got to where I was and how I am where I am now. And so I come across Tommy Robinson in this period of time where he goes to jail for, as he's presenting it to the audience online, trying to report on Muslim grooming gangs. He goes to jail and I see this as a suppression of journalism, a suppression of free speech by a tyrannical government. You know, and I ignored the fact that it was contempt to court and he knew exactly it was contempt to court and he did it deliberately to provoke this reaction. But the way it was being presented was very clever. Again, it it's because you're in touch with reality, brother. The underlying issue of Islam, etc. But it was just about free speech. And, so when you're and the conservatives, they're always like this. Libertarian pro free speech. When reality comes to reality, they don't, they don't, they don't match up. They don't, they don't read. Why are they attacking these people for their speech? And it unfortunately has this yeah. effect of making you think that the person is a truth teller and the government are trying to suppress them. And yeah. it reinforces your belief in what they're saying must be, accepted. must have some truth to it if they want to hide it so bad. And these people, these, what I would now consider grifters, they know that. They know that that's the response and the feeling it's going to create in people. They want to be martyrs because then people will follow them even more ardently. Free Tommy Robinson and free him now. And so, yeah, I go to like a, a rally, like a pro. Uh, uh, f what? No. And so, yeah, I go to like a, a rally, like a pro. Uh, uh, free speech. Not a woman in sight. Which rally. When That's not a place for a woman. Tommy Robinson's about to go to jail. And I come across Nico, and I see Nico, and I've seen him online. And I saw how he was trying to present everyone that went to a Tommy Robinson rally as a racist. And I knew from my perspective and knowing who I was, I knew I wasn't a racist. And so I go up yeah. to Nico and I tell the people around him that he's trolling you and he's trying to like make you look stupid online. And then Nico does misrepresent me in the video and he says that I went up to the police and told them to get rid of Nico. The police then came over and surprise, surprise, he started crying to them as well. When in reality, I was actually saying to the police that Nico has his free speech, because you know, I'm fucking obsessed with free speech in this period of time, I don't know why. I think it's the single most mm -hmm. important thing on earth. But either way, like, as much as I disagree with myself for being at that rally and supporting Tommy Robinson in that time, 
I still stand by the fact that I don't think these people understood why people were presenting them as racist, right? And I wanted, I just want to touch on that. Bro, tell me a Trump policy right now. I support... Fake, fake, fake waffle. You're waffling, man. Yeah, I answered the question. I support his trade policy. How dare you take this? How dare you? This you know, now, from, you know, the view I have now, I understand there are sort of two types of racism. There's sort of, there's like overt racism, which is like, you know, I fucking hate migrants when you send them back, they're the worst. And then you have this kind of more like subconscious racism or like in effect racism. And what I mean by that is like, I knew I wasn't racist because I grew up very multiculturally and I liked people of different races. I had lots of friendships with them and I got along with them very well. So I never in my heart felt anything bad towards people of different races. But what can happen from there is when you think you're like immune to racism, you sometimes are more susceptible to it in a way, but just a different type of racism. These grifters know they can't just say that, I don't know, black people are inferior genetically, although they've some of them have started doing that again. They found sneakier ways of wrapping it, often by hiding behind culture. These pundits will lie and say stuff like 84% of, of grooming gangs are Asian Pakistani, which has been endlessly disproven. It is white people who make up the majority of grooming gangs. But all this misinformation can lead you to believe that their culture is inferior to ours, and therefore we can't mix. And with the Tommy Robinson thing, it's kind of the same when it comes to Islam, right? You didn't hate people for being like having brown skin. You were simply critiquing their ideology, their beliefs. You Said wouldn't that. do that with Sir the, William Would Cladstone you do that with the that. Bible? Show some respect. Show some respect. Show some respect. Have you read this book? The people, have you read this there book? There are over There's a hundred, billion people. So, you know, I'm listening to the greatest hits, right? I'm listening to Ben Shapiro debates and 12 year old feminists. I'm listening to Jordan Peterson, Matt Walsh, I'm Joe Rogan till I fucking die. And I find myself accepting that I must be right wing now. And, you know, little hipster Jimmy. That's cool because now I'm different to everyone. I'm the contrarian, right? I have all the different opinions. Oh no, the sky isn't blue. Actually, no, it's a, it's a shade of maroon. And like when you're listening to all this stuff, you get this sort of impression of the left. Like you're, you, what you're perceiving the left to be like, uh, basically the worst of the left. You know you're millennial when you question whether or not it's ethical to bring children into this world. That's a climate change don't really know whether or not the world's going to be habitable in 30 years. And so you just get pushed further and further <laughs> right from more of a reactionary position rather than some actual ideological and maybe academic understanding of economies and politics. It just sort of is a feeling. And it's so funny, like when Ben Shapiro and these sort of people get famous off of facts don't care about your feelings. But to be honest, like conservatives these days, it just seems to be mainly emotion. It's how they feel about topics. They hate when you bring up academic papers and actual facts, and they don't trust any of that. In Springfield, they're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And ABC News did reach out to the city manager there. Uh, he told us there have been no credible reports of specific claims <laughs> been that been no reports. been harmed, injured, or abused by individuals within the immigrant community. Well, All I've this. seen people on television. Let me just and either way, I find myself as a right-winger. I have not descended into overtly racist beliefs or overtly transphobic beliefs, misogynistic beliefs. I haven't gone that far, but I probably do house some sort of unconscious discriminatory beliefs in maybe trans people People, perhaps even women to a degree again often wrapping their push for equality and better rights as some kind of marxist revolution but i believe in the typical sort of right-wing viewpoint that the state should be smaller that people are responsible for themselves and probably the yeah that like poor people are just lazy and they need to fix their own yeah uh i'm sorry buddy i'm gonna sub unsub
Oh, I see. Never mind. He's not saying he's a liberal. No, not once has he said he's a liberal. No, he's saying how he escaped the alt right pipeline. I see. So, but I don't want to watch this guy if he's if he's right wing because I can tell it comes up all the time. Like I, he, I've stayed away from him because of stuff like this. I'm gonna stay sub to him, but I don't want I don't want you to recommend this. this I don't want you to I, this, this particular topic. I'm not interested. You can recommend the channel, but that topic, I'm, I'm not interested. Despite what the reaction towards Star Citizen 1.0 has been, it is still going to be possible to have a solo play activity within the game, and much of the game is still going to be NPC and AI driven. All of that is still going to be in the game, although perhaps not quite to the extent that was originally envisioned. So yes, Star Citizen 1.0 is shaping up to be highly player driven as we discussed in yesterday's video with players taking a central role in shaping the universe through base building Interesting. and other player guided elements. Base building, so yes, whilst increasingly over time Star Citizen does seem to be increasingly moving towards that direction and leaning in that uh, direction more heavily, it's important to point out that Star Citizen 1.0 will still have plenty of room for solo player activity. Those who I prefer engaging with NPC driven content. So today I want to talk about some of that and what we saw at CitizenCon regarding all this. So this video is going to be focusing on NPCs, missions and guilds. All of these play a central role in shaping the overall experience. You can jump between the various sections by looking at the video guide points below the chapter markers. Let's start with NPC driven guilds then. The guilds play a central role in Star Citizen 1.0, serving as a backbone for profession-based progression and providing a structured path for players through NPC interactions. This includes guilds, and this is going to be pretty important. I am. Guilds. I will be honest with my thoughts, and I, I've late, lately I've actually thought that that my thoughts are better kept to myself. You know, and that's actually a terrible uh, <clears throat> desire as a streamer. I will share what I'm thinking. I wish to come to Star Citizen on a, on the $45 thing, and I don't know if it has a monthly or what. I don't know what it is, but I'll pay for a little while. And and my interest in it is is AFKing, uh, some kind of hauling career, so that I can alt-tab to it and watch it spin up its beautiful, beautiful graphics. And I think that's probably actually probably a fair um desire to have from the game and i expect it to maybe actually uh come through okay. with that okay. because I'm, I'm beginning to realize that while i like eve's graphics and always have i don't think they're modern at all and that's something that bothers me like these graphics they look good but they don't look like space to me they look like some kind of colony war shooter these graphics look like fucking like space and planets to me. And if if Star Citizen can give me building a base that I can come back to to stuff my loot and my money into. Oh, there's an endurance here. Kenzor in an, in, an, in an endurance. I wonder if he cares if I'm here. I don't need to stress him out, so I'm just going to leave. Okay. Um, well, okay. That's okay. I'll go to the other one then. Warp drive active. Yeah, there's two, there's two spots here. I, you know, it's all good. It's all good in the hood. I don't want to feel like it's, it's like stepping on him. I don't want to draw attention to him. Splitting up the belts keeps the predators moving to both targets. It's, it's just wiser to split up. That guy's in an expensive ship. He doesn't want interference or other people there. I don't want other people there. So I'm just, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and so, and, and I don't want this gameplay where I feel like I'm hunted all the time because then I, I constantly have to come back and look at the game. What I want is an autopilot that I can set that, that'll just, you know, and I might even look at that in this game. I'm thinking now, oh no, I can't though. Cause you're constantly like, I don't know, like, and I, and, 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 and to me, the value of star citizen is not in the loading screens actually and if it takes 90 hours to go to one destination i'm actually okay with that because it because it's kind of crazy it's like being on a real space flight 
And I think the RP value of Star Citizen is there and has always been there. What I don't think is good about it is it's is this nasty monetary nature. But I, I I mean I've seen enough videos to understand that this th this is a real game, you know. My real problem is this is it predatory, and then and then can I play it AFK solo? And that's why I'm looking at this video. I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I, I, can I play it solo? Can I spin it up as a hauler? I'm thinking about No Man's Sky for the same reasons, kind of. I want to be a hauler in No Man's Sky, except I don't know how realistic that is because it's a beautiful, beautiful game. I'm, but I'm just wondering, can I AFK the fucking flight and just have it AFK spin out? And I want to, I want to tab back to it from New World where I'm doing my combat all the time. I don't need Star Citizen to have combat. Oh man, I'm hooking up these cooks. I should not do this really. Yeah, why not just, like, stack this stuff, huh? Until it gets up higher? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, hey, that was a little bit easier than I, than I thought. It, 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 you know, it wasn't so bad. I need to go back to the town, however, but I'll have a turn in here, though. Oh, I should do the war board if there is one. I can't remember. Um. Oh yeah. Oh, did I pull quests from here? Yeah. You see the truth. And when you uh, no, that's not it. Wait, I mean, what are we talking about here? You're saying over here? Oh, I see it. I see it. And I realized that that um, Eve will always play in the background because I can drop the settings on it to, to like basically zero. And I can put all of my computer's graphical oomph, all of, all of its horsepower into running Star Citizen because I can, I can, I can uh, uh, pass off the cost of business of playing other games to NVIDIA GeForce Now and in like a yearly sub to the Xbox Ultimate Game Pass and there will always be games to be able to play there. And I could do interesting things like run Fallout 76 on Xbox Ultimate. But see, the problem is like they, they all shut themselves off. So I'm looking for a game to put in the background. Like I, like like uh, Eve does not do do it for me. Uh, there's times when Eve is really, truly beautiful and it feels like you're out in the universe, but now after like 20 years of it, it's lost its immersion to me and it feels like I'm this little ship in a tiny little pocket and, and like a, and what feels like infinitesimal space, but doesn't feel like that because you have to do jump, 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 jump. And so I want the immersion that Starfield promised without the goddamn loading screens. And the and, 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 and No Man's Sky kind of focused too much on planetary survival stuff. And while I do want survival stuff, and what, I, I mean, I do want it. What I really want is to be like a hauler trader person. And so I'm going to look at several games along that bent one of them is x4 uh x4 might be good enough if it's if it's if it's um you know uh if it's graphically beautiful but i don't know and uh and uh, I'm, uh, uh and i don't think it's what i'm looking for i think uh the star citizen rp is there for a cheap price if they'll sell me uh the ability to play the game for 45 dollars and i can just play that initial fucking ship and do the most basic ass i'm talking tier one fucking hauling missions that keep me busy for for hundreds and hundreds of hours maybe i could foresee supporting star citizen but I want that graphical fidelity of flying in a fucking ship. And, and what I'm hearing about the ships 
is you can you, you you like the interior of the star control ships has always blown me blown me away and i watched an influential video yesterday talking about how like like a guy just tapping the fucking chalkboard about the importance like a fucking professor and he's right i didn't know this till he said it he, he was like tapping the chalkboard chalkboard uh in, in reference to like how important it was to the interior of the cabin of the ship being amazing. I'm talking fucking amazing. Maybe with crew even. And and all this. And Star Citizen was embracing that. The RP of just the, the idea of actually being on a fucking spaceship. On a, journey, or on a journey that might take days and days and days. And so they were saying that, that like you, you can speed it up if you want to. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I, but I mean, I play so many games that I'm okay with it taking three hours to 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 to, to, to take me from, you know, a planet that's on one side of just this solar system to the other. I'm actually okay with that. I'm okay with tabbing back and looking at it and being like, hey, it's kind of cool. Go to this port. Go to that port. I'm uh, welcome to the Starship Skycat Live. These are the voyages of the only cool person left in humanity. I'm talking the last the starry bit. I'm the last the starry. You understand? I'm the last cool motherfucker left in the fucking universe. I, I like I don't I don't know what it is. I'm I'm kidding, but I'm I'm the last the starry, and I'm on my ship, and I'm and I'm hauling for all the humans, right? And how I view it is is I get to look out the fucking video, or so I get to look out the fucking window. See, the problem with this game is 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 like inside the ship is crappy. It's crappier. It's crappier than than Elite Dangerous. It's crappy. It's like a, it's like crappy as hell. So, and I'm I'm thinking like. I think Elite Dangerous forces you to fly. I don't know, but I I I and I I played Elite Dangerous, but I don't think it I don't think it lets you just autopilot. If Star Citizen lets you st set like you know a fucking uh what are they called uh like a uh uh uh, uh coordinate. And and then it and then it takes between depending on whether you wanna want it to go and autopilot there really quickly or really slowly. Can I get the RP feeling of flying in an an endless universe there where where I'm just I'm not hand solo, I'm FedEx. I, I actually would like I want I wanna be like you can do that in this game, but it's fucking boring and all the time you're being fucking like this game was up is is about PvP. I don't think Star Citizen is necessarily about PvP. I think it is to a degree, but but I think it's more likely to be PvP down on the ground with guns than it is probably on the ships, and the ships probably do do happen and there is PvP and stuff. But like if the universe is vast like they're saying it is, I have suddenly fallen in the idea like in love with the idea of being a space hauler from and, and i might try this in no man's sky too but i don't I, I played no man's sky i know how it works you have to like la you have to like land at the place then you go out and it's like and it's cool when you're leaving the 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 fucking the the planet and it is rp it's fucking dope but it's still kind of a kids game it's like a kids arcade game can, can i think compared to something like eve online or star citizen now there's other games out there like this. I saw one last night called X4, and I'm definitely gonna buy that. Uh, but uh, I don't think the graphics in X4 are good. I don't. Th I don't think the graphics in Eve Online are that good anymore. I'm starting to look at it like, where are the fucking stars? There's like no stars here. If you really think about it, it's kind of a boring motif. It's like this is the most interesting looking place in Eve. It definitely is Poshvan, because it's all tinted red and well done and stuff and kind of crazy. And the suns are like really bright and, and they're always visible and stuff. But like. This is not visually a next gen looking game anymore and I don't I don't feel the RP of being in the ship. I feel like I'm playing with model ships. You see it? I feel like I'm playing with model ships and it's cool, but I I don't have any immersion to this ship. It feels like kind of a a basic tab target MMO to me now. Where I'm like, no, I, it has no immersion or mist or anything. Starfield fucking failed because it was all loading screens when I needed it to be like visual representations of leaving the planet. Starfield had good internal ships, but the problem is, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's, it's a good game. I think it was 76 trying to, to add 
you know, it like it's it, well, it's not even good like seventy six though. The combat's not even good like seventy six or even freeform with stuff like nukes and stuff like that. The com the com the the combat wasn't good, not at all. Like it wasn't even close to good like seventy six. And so then I'm like, and 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 then the, the, you can tell they immediately immediately Bethesda looked at it as like this graphical way to connect the dungeons. I'm looking for a graphical way to feel like I'm flying out there in the fucking universe, so far from anybody who who would even know where I was or anything like that. And that's you know there is games that promise that, but but I've been on this subject for for like two days solid now. I'm like, why haven't they made a good space exploration game? that I can play like EVE Online that has a good sandbox to it where I can like spin off some fucking hauler expecting like a 12 hour fucking journey because I don't speed that journey up. I just actually fly the fucking ship to the fucking destination, even if it does take 50 fucking hours. And I'm okay with the RP of that. And I'm like, okay, well, I won't be in, in, in this, this uh, place uh, for 50 hours, right? And I could run like a personal rule where, where like, you know, once I got there, I could probably fast travel back if I want to save some time, if I want to see some content I haven't seen yet. But I want to feel like I'm, and I believe Star Citizen actually does supply that, the feel of being on a ship that you can like, you can, you can like set on an auto coordinate and then you can, you can walk about the ship and I think there is a future in that. That's there about as strong a future as something as like World of Warcraft or Rust. I think you know. I think there is a future in that. Now I went to the second one, right? Yeah, yeah. I went to the second one. Yeah. Um, hey, I made money. A lot of money. Like a lot of verifiable money already. Like, and all, and honestly, Bez has only gone up. <laughs> Content within the game. Guilds act as governing bodies. See, look. Now that's that's a valuable insight of what I'm actually looking at, right? I don't see what I'm looking for. Well, there's field gatherer, which is basically the same thing as hauling. Oh, I can tow. I mean, towing is hauling. Towing might be good. Breakdown engineer, United Wayfarers Club. Astro Mana, refined ref, refined materials. Salvage Docking permission mine. requested. Docking request accepted. I mean, I mean, why not mine? Why not mine? Yeah, I, I see some, I, I I guess what it is, is I used to despise RP, but then when, I, but then when, like, I, I've now been to the top of several PvP communities, and like, I know that, 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 uh, it, that, that it's actually all in your head, all of it, how much esteem the best people in the world have, all of that stuff is entirely in your head and subjective, and so now I look at roleplay and having fun as, as an, an immersed individual, it, it, it's, it's cool, but uh, I, you know, and, and I saw I saw some possibilities last night, like start uh, spaceship engineers. I'm gonna buy I'm gonna buy that game. That's that's gonna be probably some of the best twenty dollars that I ever spent. My problem with spaceship engineers is, do I have to do all that that stuff to about about like base building and stuff, or can I just make a base ship and then begin a hauling career? I you know I believe I believe there is hauling in. Let's go look at, at, at uh, No Man's Sky's hauling, because that might actually be kind of a cool bit of content for the stream. And I want to finish this guy's video, but I kind of screwed up here, so hold on. I, I want to put... Um... I don't know. Here we go. Despite so the I direction towards... Uh, 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 stop, stop, stop. I want to see... Um, you know, Dual Universe, I thought, might actually be a really fucking good game. Suddenly, I, I'm looking at Dual Universe might be really good. But I don't know. Um, I know that they put a bunch of work into Dual Universe. And I watched one of my favorite streamers play it for like a year before I ever became a streamer. And But then Dual Universe died, which is frankly sad... I believe, yeah. There, oh no, there's a standalone version of it. Oh yeah, there's a uh, there's a stand. Oh, uh, dual my my du dual universe without subscription. Okay, well let's see what they have to say. That's that's informative. Well, do you want to play subscription free? Want unlimited resources? Want PvP on or off? Yeah. <clears throat> Play without subscription. They poured four blue groups you own. 
not. See, this isn't my type of game. I don't need a game to be this deep. Uh, honestly, I don't really need my game to be as uh, as involved as, say, running a mechanic shop. I need my game to be fun and mindless. And so I don't think Dual Universe is it, and I don't think Star, uh, I don't think Spaceship Engineers is it. But I did look at, I think, I, I did see something in X4, maybe. We'll see. I saw some cool stuff in X4. We'll see. Uh, and, and you could do, and there's towing and stuff. So let's see about hauling in No Man's Sky, which is a dumb, dumb thing. But I mean, yeah, hauling in uh, No Man's Sky, hauling, right? Cargo hauling, yeah. 15 best free S-Class haulers. Thank you, Q-Ball Gaming. I've liked this up to your channel. It's Q-Ball back at you. And today I will show you how to find 15 best free haulers in No Man's Sky. Only fans. You have to get off the ground in No Man's Sky, but that only takes like a like a playthrough, like a you know like a, like a sit a sitting, and then I think you get out to the universe, and I believe that might actually be the, some of the RP that I'm looking for. <laughs> All of them are S class crash ship locations, and holo ships have the biggest inventory. That also means they are worth the most, so they are perfect for scrapping for money and nanites, or just if you want to get a max slot ship for yourself. And I'm going to show you the best ones and how to find them fast and easy. Also, if you like this kind of videos and want to see many more of them, the best way to show me that is to hit that thumbs up. And if you haven't yet subscribed for more, we want to reach 20,000 subscribers. By so okay, so we see this video. This is a good video. I want to. I want to know about. And I gotta look at my various different hardcore things here. Fuck, you locked me out of New World because I was on the auction house. You're so annoying. The auction house doesn't register that you're moving, so it locks you out even faster if you're sitting on it. It's so annoying. Uh, yep, and I want to get you spinned up on another fight. Uh, where am I right now on Eve? I'm, I'm inside. While I'm inside, I'm gonna go pee. I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yes, and and so and 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 so I want um I want to feel like I'm fighting on on a on a medieval like planetary war like uh like New World or Rust or something like that, where there's people around to feel social and I'm but I'm, I'm not talking to any of them, and I'm um <laughs> and uh and I want to feel like I'm working on a sandbox like Eve Online that has like the most depth that any game has really. And so, and I can do all that, and then I want an RP spaceship game where it always feels like I'm flying somewhere. And I want that to feel like, and then I want to be able to RP, get in and out of the part, the, the, in and out of the captain's chair and move about the ship and consult for, for, you know, like, like the net and, and the information and stuff and, and all this. And, and Eve Online does this fairly well, but the, the internal feeling like you're an actual player isn't there. And I'm beginning to now become a convert to the star citizen point of view. And I begin to realize how bad he probably has to rip people off just to get that to work but if you supply what i want i i might be happy with his game you know if he's if he supplied what i want um so we go looking for 
Ah, uh, No Man's Sky cargo hauling, right? Oh, smuggling, yeah. How to make a whole lot of spacey money by smuggling in No Man's Sky, okay. Man, space is expensive. As you fly around the skies of, well, No Man's Sky, you may find yourself a bit strapped for cash. Luckily, there's an easy way to earn some credits out there, and all you have to do is break some intergalactic trade laws. I'm Jamie Latour, and I'm going to show you how to be an expert smuggler in No Man's Sky. To begin your life as a professional Han Solo impersonator, you first need to find an outlaw station. You can stumble across these, but to reliably find these stations, you're going to need to install some ship upgrades. Head to the Space Anomaly, which you should be able to call once you've found it, and look for this happy alien merchant named Inneration Hyperion. Then make sure you have the teleport receiver upgrade installed on your ship, and once you have that, you can then purchase either the conflict scanner or the economy scanner. You can buy both of these upgrades, but to find an outlaw station, you only need to See, buy this one. is like kids, yeah. Now that you have a scanner, it's time to find a star system populated by dirtbags like us. Go into the galaxy map. If you bought the economy scanner, look for a galaxy that has the words black market at the end. If you got the conflict scanner, it'll say pirate controlled. Once you've found a galaxy with either or both of these conditions, warp there and you should come across an outlaw station. These are just like regular space stations. See, this isn't good enough. This isn't what I'm looking for. For factions within this guild, Players can earn reputation and unlock exclusive rewards. Other guilds include... So there's a lot of cool just travel stuff like towing, refueling, mining, salvager maybe, or no, no, not salvage, but uh, no, no. I'm looking for long form travel that doesn't take a lot of my attention. <laughs> Usually that would be hauling, but you could do other stuff like towing, towing, I guess. Instead of transport guild which is ideal for players interested in hauling and trading. Oh, okay. no, never mind. There's the, no, they, they, they do have cargo delivery. Oh, yeah, here we go. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to buy... Uh, I, I, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy in, in a couple of days here. I'm going to buy um, Star Citizen. Let's go look at the... Uh, let's go look at the... Uh, what's it called? Um, the deals... Uh, yeah, the pledge store. Let's go look at the pledge store. <clears throat> what can I play the beta with and how much? Is it $45 now? Perfect pilots looking to scream into the verse just in time for the scariest of seasons. This spectacular Drake Cutter starter package comes complete with a bonus ghoulish green print thing. How much is this? I want to see the price tag. $45 for the Aurora, Miss, uh, uh, the Aurora MR starter pack. Cutter. So the Aurora... MR stat starter pack utility into a T is a program for new ship errors but it's enough to tackle myriad of channels but additional combat effectiveness come from this upgraded weapons package uh, starts your visually launched with the persistent universe it's going to also let you experience a taste of intense dog fighting FPS action with two distinct multiplayer game modes arena commander and star marine So, yeah, so they're in alpha, and I think it's about time to finally start playing this game, actually. And so I think I will buy, like, a game package. I'll buy the $45 game package that they want to sell for Halloween or whatever it is. Starter pack, starter pack, war bond. They're, all, they're cheaper right now. War MR, the cutter... Mustang Alpha Starter Pack, Pisces, Cutter, Sayulin, Nomad Starter Pack, Cutlass, Freelancer, and Constellation. 
So I guess Oh, and it gets bonus items too. Maybe that might be the best deal. I don't know what it'll be the day that I buy it, but I will buy this. I just don't have the, the money in my bank account right now until the first. I don't want to move money around for this. It's stupid. Uh, so, yeah, let's hear what else he had to say, I guess. Um... Working with factions like Linga Family Holding. Recovery cargo, cargo delivery, passenger delivery, vehicle delivery, data delivery, cargo delivery, transport and sell, buy and deliver. And Red Wind. Then there's the Imperial Sports Federation. This caters to. There's a racing pilot. Parkour athlete, racing driver, industrial athlete, marksman. Devils and racing enthusiasts offering missions related to racing tracks and other sports. Next up, the Academy of Sciences. Focused on exploration and research, supporting professions like science and cartography with factions such as the Imperial Cartography Center. The Mercenary Guild is another one. This represents lawful combat professions, including bounty hunting and military contracts. And then we have one simply known as the Council, a shadowy group representing criminal activities, offering missions for players interested in outlaw professions. The guilds not only provide structured progression, but also add depth to the game world by introducing unique inventories and rewards. Each guild offers a distinct set of items and ships that align with their associated professions, encouraging players to engage with the different guilds to access a variety of content. So yet the guild system looks to be an area where players who are very much interested and dedicated towards uh, making their own way in the world are likely going to be wanted to head. Next up is NPC missions and narrative. CRG say that at the heart of Star Citizen 1.0, is a main story designed to guide players through the universe. This introduces them to various professions, locations, and guilds. It's a narrative experience that is NPC-driven and crafted to provide an adventure across the various different star systems. The main story serves as the spine of the universe, so CIG say, helping onboard new players and existing players by showcasing the various different features and content available in the game. The story itself is structured to allow players the freedom to engage with it at their own pace. They will be forced to engage with it you know, all the way through as they choose to. So that means they can choose to hop on and off on the narrative journey whenever they wish, providing flexibility for those who prefer to explore independently on <coughs> specific activities. The main story is not mandatory, and that means it will that ensure that players who want to chart their own path let can do so begin. without any restrictions. I will read aloud NPCs that do play a significant role in delivering this narrative, she quite she obviously, and I'm glad trouble. to see that, with a cast of various different characters that bring the universe to life and should hopefully uh, make these missions feel a little bit more interesting. The NPCs themselves represent the various different factions within, within the uh, guilds and provide missions that align with their respective professions. This? For example, the players may receive missions from the United Wayfarers Club within the Interstellar Transport Guild or from the Bounty Hunters Guild within the Mercenary Guild. Location stories further enrich the game world by offering short NPC-driven missions scattered throughout, uh, scattered across landing zones and cities. So these stories exist outside the main narrative, but provide an additional lore and character to the locations they inhabit. They allow players to delve deeper into the history and the culture of different areas, enhancing immersion and providing more opportunities for solo play. The narrative and mission structure then is designed to showcase the various different uh, gameplay options available in Star Citizen 1.0 that that we all hope are actually there upon release, and that can be ranging from combat and exploration to trade and industrial activities. Next up is the dynamic economy. Now we touched on this with uh, the video yesterday, where all the player crafting and player uh, building will be directly tied into the dynamic economy, but there is more to it than just that. The dynamic economy itself is powered by CIG's Sarsim system, and this automatically adjusts in-game prices based on player activity. 
The economy itself is designed to be influenced by both player and NPC actions, and this should ensure that solo players can have a meaningful impact on the game world. To create a balanced economy where credits flow both in and out, the game implements systems such as taxes and insurances, so yeah, like I mentioned before, it seems there's just no way to get away from that, even in games. I didn't know I wanted this RP this badly until now. I didn't know how disappointed I was that Starfield sucked as much as it did. And... Yeah, I don't know. It's just like, I think I said what I needed to say. And it was all loading screens. It wasn't good enough. It was a beautiful game, but it was still not good enough. <clears throat> Damn, one seventy seven. Wasted him. I better wait. I love Final Fantasy Hardcore. It's so fun, actually. It's, it's the pace that I always wanted from the game. It actually is. It's like, fucking sweet. Actions like repairing, refueling, and restocking ships now have significant value, making financial decisions very, well, a little bit more impactful, I guess. You know, you're going to have to be a little bit careful when you lose your ship. And that means two main in taxes are introduced. There's the inheritance tax, which is uh, part of the death of a spaceman mechanic that's been uh, discussed by Chris Roberts right since day one, pretty much. This affects the transfer of assets upon the character's death. And then there's security tax. This covers the cost of planetary shield technology per player basis. Now, ship insurance is another component of the economy, and this is one that has caused quite a few... Uh, what the the game looks stuff. amazing. I want this RP. The RP is way better than No Man's Sky. You can see it. Arguments over... <coughs> and the forums over the previous days, although uh, CIG have stepped in and clarified things quite a bit. Ultimately, players can choose from three tiers of insurance, each offering different levels of coverage for ship chassis, uh, components as well as their decorations. Insurance with a warranty ensures that players receive a new ship and equipment if their original ship is lost. So yeah, it's the old adage of don't buy it if you can't afford it. The dynamic economy affects uh, commodity prices as well, resource availability and market fluctuations, all of which are influenced by NPC activities as well as player trading and missions. So for solo players, this means that engaging in professions like mining, salvaging and trading can have uh, effects on the economy itself. See, I like hearing that because like, like, like what I had always heard was is all they had was the RP, but if they're actually adding reasons to do it, then I'll play the game, you know? Wrong relative was touched, okay. Why even bother? Okay, so. Middle. I will not surrender the Janus. Enough! Our bond is severed. Oh, you just moved it forward. Good, because I, I don't like the puzzle. I don't want to think. We have done it. These guys are running Merc, and I could just join. <clears throat> it's an appropriate time to do Merc. It'd be fun to see Merc. I like Merc. Merc's a good, good run. I don't think I'm really ready, though. I'd rather cap out. I'm only three levels from the end. NPCs, meanwhile, provide missions that uh, contribute to economic growth. The players can participate in these activities to earn credits and influence other market conditions. So 
And yet that means that ultimately the economy isn't quite as independent as it was back in the days when uh, CIG spoke about their quanta system and it's moved away from that to be more of a player driven economy although one still heavily influenced by NPCs nonetheless. For solo players then, why Star Citizen 1.0 does include extensive multiplayer and cooperative elements. Again, we spoke about all of this in yesterday's video. It does still offer some features for solo players as well. The main story and the guild missions provide a whole range of content that can be uh, well, enjoyed independently. If you don't like joining organisations and don't want to be a base builder or you don't want to uh, go and grind and gather resources to construct space stations, if you're that type of player, well, you can choose to focus on professions instead that suit your solo playstyle. And, well, that's pretty much how I like to play as well. Whether that's exploration, mining, trading, or participating there, I'm 63 in now. stories. Do keep in mind, of course, that all of this is for the future. CIG are simply detailing what they want to create rather than what they have created. And many of much of it may be many years away. That's a good fire yeah, stat that I might want to keep. No. Nope. As detailed at the recent Citizen Con was uh, quite surprising, to me at least, quite a departure from the original vision of a self-sustaining universe that was nice. How are you today? Given. Roasted new fish. Yeah, yeah, that's a good recipe. Conceptually, yeah, yeah roasted new fish. Is somewhat of a Sweet, that's a good recipe. That's an expensive one. And the original uh, idea of an NPC driven galaxy. To what extent and in which direction that this lies, whether it's more player driven or more NPC driven, only Okay, they tells. want me to go Despite east what, uh, again, so but now. Oh, yeah, and then really the main MSQ. We see MSQ. I have a turn in over there, so let's go turn in over there. As I mentioned yesterday's, in yesterday's video, it does seem to me that the game is living, uh, leaning pretty heavily in the direction of player generated content and uh, player driven sandbox. Specifically, and especially uh, when you get towards the end game, there is still some room here for those of us who like to play in a somewhat of a solo item, a lone wolf amongst a uh, dynamic and living, breathing galaxy. Again, it's likely to be some time until we hear more the about dream. This, and even more until we see some solid implementation of these things. Either way, that's pretty much what we have to discuss today. All the details that have been revealed about the Star Citizen 1.0 in terms of how you can engage with it as a lone player. Uh, thanks for watching this video all the way through. There's another one on the screen if you want to watch that one. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll catch you next time. This was good. How many calculations <laughs> do you... <coughs> Excuse me. This was good. Um, I I, uh, I want to look at now tutorials from 2024. Star Citizen Tutorial. Yeah, 24 from five months ago. Yeah, this one's 40 minutes long. 27, 45, 45, 45. Free fly. Oh, fry flick is good to start. So, about good how to start a citizen easy. Free fly starts August 15, 2024, and ends the 22nd. So, they only do that for about a week, anyways. The mega. Look at it at, at views. Yeah, this guy got views. So, what is what we'll watch, I guess. Thank you, Burks. I'd into. like to sub to your channel. Or even knowing what to buy on the website that gets you into the game. And this patch oops hi i'm burks your guide and captain on today's star citizen tutorial all right it's not <laughs> that serious but star citizen is a complicated and confusing game to jump into or even knowing what to buy on the website that gets you into the game yeah and this patch is the biggest yet so i broke it up this video into easy to follow segments along with this bar that's going to let you know how much time is left in the section and when you're at a good pausing point feel free to bookmark this and come back anytime you need some help so first off what is star citizen well it is a massive incredibly immersive and nearly seamless sci-fi mmo and it's not just spaceships there is a considerable amount of content on the ground and huge locations to explore it's first person and there's bounty hunting, mining, trading, box delivery, racing, exploring, salvaging, global events, smuggling, piracy, PvP, and an almost limitless high detail universe with just one initial loading screen. While I know this may sound too good to be true, it kind of is.
the game still has a ton of issues, but it is getting better each update. So if all that sounds good to you and you're willing to spend $45 Update. on the most wild and sometimes messy game I've ever played, or maybe a returning player learning the new features of this update, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Next up, making an account. Follow the link in my description for a referral plus an extra 5k when you start out. Nice. After your sign up is complete, you'll head to the pledge store. And this is where the real gameplay is. Look at those sweet, sweet JPEGs. Just kidding. I'm a huge advocate for buying ships in-game, and it's totally doable, but keep in mind until Star Citizen 1.0, which is going to be a while, every six months or so, in-game progressions are reset. Real money purchases are not reset, but I oh, play yeah. every patch with just a starter account in one ship. And if yeah, that's every patch with just a starter account in one ship. In my opinion, it is way more fun and rewarding to have that progression in-game. Yeah. That being said, if you want to pay for my dream game, Godspeed, citizen. You're looking specifically for yeah. game packages. Personally, I love the Avenger Titan. It's one of the fastest ships in the game and faster than all the popular pirate ships, if you catch what I'm saying. It's decent at combat, has a bed you can log out anywhere, internal storage, Ooh. and 8SCU of cargo. If you want something cheaper, you can follow this tutorial. No, no, that's what I'll buy. I'll buy. It's good advice. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know how to bed. Yeah, the bed looks dope. See the RP? Like, like my thing is, is like, I can ignore all the idiots if I'm just out running all the time. Oh, oh, oh. No, no. There's, no, no, no. Um, uh, I just got here. Eh. Stations. Duck. It's a thrasher. Is he going to kill me? No. Sorry, buddy. You didn't even get me through uh, armor. What the hell was that? You came immediately. But that's okay. It was a nice attempt. Nice attempt. Okay. You know, maybe I'll uh, pop over. I mean, I don't know. Now he might be, like, hunting. Uh, no, no. I'll just sit up for a minute. It's fine. We'll do some gambling. I'm rich. Fuck it. I'll do some gambling. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm up money. A lot of money. <laughs> I'm up 200 million. Okay, well, let's go do do some cheap bets here. Ooh, yeah, we'll take a swing of Kiki Mora, I think. Oh, I... Okay. Well, shit. Run the Kiki Mora. MR or the Mustang Alpha, which are both great starters too. Last thing before you buy, make sure your PC at least. No, the I want to be faster than everybody else. I'd recommend checking out the telemetry page in the description to get an idea of what FPS. My PC is fine. After your purchase is complete, head to the Play Now in the top right. Go ahead and click Download and install the launcher. Once you've done that, it's going to ask you to sign in and then download the current patch, which is 323 Live. It should be about 80 gigabytes in total, and now would be a great time 80 gigabytes. to pause to let it finish. Go ahead and launch the game, and the first thing you're going to do is go over to options. Let's take a quick look at our graphic settings. Personally, I like doing native high resolution, but depending on your build, you might want to try out the new DLSS features. Oh, yeah. Or FSR if you're oh, good. They got DLSS. Graphics. It's going to be great. Aside from that, I like to have my clouds down to medium or off. This really helps with performance. Yeah, clouds. My is set mm -hmm. to 100. V-Sync off unless you're streaming because it helps with tearing. Film grain, motion blur, and chromatic aberration are off completely. And we'll go over more settings later on in the video, but for now, head back to the menu. What the hell are we there doing are two here? two options. Arena Commander, which is an amazing way to get good and get experience without losing your gear in the PU. The PU, or Persistent Universe, is the main part of the game. And Arena this is where Commander. all your long-term progression happens. The first time you jump in, it will ask you to build a character. This is my fast attempt at myself. You can take a lot of time building these out if you want. After you're done, click review and make sure you name and save your design so you can use your characters in future patches. Next, let's pick our landing zone, and you have four locations. Lauraville, Orison, Area 18, and New Babbage. But New Babbage has amazing views, good missions, multiple FPS and armor shops, and maybe the best ship upgrade shops in the game. It's also going to let you know that you can do a tutorial. If you've already said yes, you need to complete it, and you can meet me at this timestamp here. I'm going to be more thorough and teach you how to make consistent money for buying anything you want in-game. Now let's dive in. After you're done loading in, the primary interaction key in Star Citizen is F. You're going to use this to interact with a lot of stuff. If you tap objects, that's going to be the most obvious action, like pick up, open, close, enter. 
but if you hold F, you'll get additional options if there's any available. Once you're done looking around, tap F on the door to open it, and here is New Babbage. Walking around might feel a little slow at first, but if you just scroll wheel up, you'll move a lot Oh, faster. it's like scum. If you hold shift, you'll run even faster than that. In game, you're going to have tooltips on Ugh. by default, and these are on your bottom right. These can be extremely helpful, and they'll change on the situation that you're in. There's also signs in Star Citizen, which can be really helpful. If you're having trouble reading them, you can hold F and scroll wheel in to do a small digital zoom. Global Chat is also accessible by pressing Enter, and you can toggle it on or off by pressing F12. Once you feel comfortable with the movement, head to the elevator and hold F on the elevator panel, then select Lobby. We have a couple of destinations here. Both of these staircases on the left and right go down to the tram, and the middle is the hospital, which as a new player, you'll get very familiar with. And on the right, we have a convenience store. So let's talk about shops, gear, and inventory. Ah, uh, yes, Kelto. Everyone loves Stanton's best convenience store where you can get a drink, maybe a snack, a helmet, and a fully automatic freedom spewing 50 round SMG. But seriously, most of these shops have everything you need. This is a smaller one, so its options are a little bit more limited, but that's okay because you don't start off with a lot of money. And even worse, when you die, your gear is up for grabs by anyone, including you if you can get back to it. That's why in the first mission I'm showing you today, I'll teach you how to get your own gear so you don't have to buy your own. Just to show you how the shop and inventory works, I'll be buying two med pins for healing, two oxy pins to refill suit oxygen in case we're running low, a chest piece since it's required to wear a backpack, you don't have to buy one now, but the multi-tool can be extremely helpful as well. And it takes a few different attachments. For example, the True Hold Tractor Beam Attachment. It can move you around an EVA, pick up items, and even help you salvage weapons off the enemies you take down. Last thing we'll get is a cruise, since food and water is a thing. And cruise happens to take care of both of those things. It's no like way! Food and water is a now thing? you only have to eat and drink every few hours, so it's not a big deal. But you'd be surprised, food and water will sneak up on you after a long play session. Now that we have our stuff, if you tap I, you can open up your main inventory. On the right is- I'm gonna get uh, some ice, I'll be right back. Am I safe here? I don't know, I want you to take me home either way. Country roads, let's go. Motherfucker, take me home. Ah! Ah, your map's so finicky. Yes, take me home, go. I don't care. Okay, I'm gonna get some ice. Let me get that glass over the counter before it Is your local stash on the left is your inventory when you're wearing items that have storage you can either drag items on your character right click and then equip or double click any item as long as you have space for it if you left shift and then left click any item it will move between your personal and your local inventory if later on you're getting thirsty or hungry you can right click your drink to carry it 
but you have to take your helmet off first. The easiest way to do that is to hit left alt and H at the same time. This will store your helmet invisibly on your belt. Then click mouse one to eat or drink, or if you hold mouse one, it will use the entire item. By this point, you've probably noticed that you have a mini map. And when your helmet is off, you have the contact mini map, which may sound a little bit unnecessary, but it's actually a great way to tell if your helmet is still off. So go ahead and press left alt and H to get it back on. Also, let's talk about the symbols above the mini map. The one on the right being armistice zone, meaning it is a no fire zone. On the left, we have monitored space. What this means is that if you commit a crime, attack another player, or do a criminal mission, that means the space government knows exactly what you did and they are going to give you a crime stat. And even go to space jail, which we're going to talk about later on. Next, let's head down the stairs to the spaceport for your first flight. While we're on the tram, let's talk about the pit menu or the personal inner thought. It's a menu in the game that allows you to get to the actions you may not know the keybind for, and it will even tell you the correct keybind for it, such as the visor wipe here. Once you've arrived at the spaceport, head off the tram and you're going to have to take an elevator up to customs. Then you have finally arrived at New Babbage Spaceport. If you're in the mood for a photo op, F4 is the third person key, and if you hold Z and use your mouse, you can pivot your camera around. Next, let's head up the stairs into the ship terminals. But first behind us, we have the rentals. You can rent ships for days at a time, but usually comes at a high price, and it's not really worth it. Your money is way more well spent on buying a ship in game. Now that we're done with that, let's head to the ship console, or better known as the Aesop. We're using the Avenger Titan, and you can see the name here, the status, the type of ship, the crew, and we have the deliver button. All your ships just at the start of the wipe are in this limbo that you need to deliver. Oh, Once you've delivered a ship for the first time, it is at that location. And if you want it somewhere else, you're going to have to physically move it or reclaim it the place you want. Let's go ahead and call the Titan out, and that's going to be Hangar 2. After taking the elevator, you can get in the Titan by walking up to the back ramp and tapping F. Some ships are going to have cockpit ladders instead, which you'll access by walking up and just tapping F on the ladder. Something that is awesome about the Titan is it has internal inventory. Keep in mind, if your ship gets destroyed and you do have loot on it, it will generate a box with all that loot inside. The Titan also has a bed, and this is a logout point in space or landed on moons or planets, as long as you're not in combat or too close to a location. Heading up to the cockpit, we have the pilot seat. Tap F to sit down. Now, if you hold F, you can see that there is a bunch of buttons to click here, including ejection. Be careful, it does work. What you're looking for on every ship is flight ready. Or if you hold the right alt and R, it will flight ready the ship. Next, we need to get this door open in front of us. Press left alt and N and that will request air traffic control. Remember this because you're going to use this button a lot. And it's the same button you'll use to call for landing later. A few settings I'd recommend changing, turning your V-Joy range down to 8 over 8. This makes it way easier to aim on a mouse. Also, turning your thrust vector indicator or your TVI on always is very helpful. This is your TVI. If you're heading full speed towards a station and it's on the station, you're going to hit it and you will die. If it's off the station, you're good. If you're not big on the camera shake effects, scroll down all the way to the bottom and turn global camera shake off, G-force induced head movements, and camera movement on boost. Also, in audio settings, there's an audio camera shake. These effects are cool, but I personally like a visually cleaner experience. If you're like me, then you can switch them off. Now that your hangar is open, go ahead and gently press spacebar to strafe up. You're going to use left control to strafe down, A to strafe to the left, and D to strafe to the right. S will move you backwards, and W will move you forward. It's Q to roll to the left, and E to roll to the right. Move your mouse around to pitch and yaw. This is your V-joint, and the more you pull it in one direction, the faster your ship will turn. Hold shift to use afterburner and X to space break. And finally, toggle your landing gear within. Next, let's talk about your HUD. Top left and most important, there are two modes of flight now. Let's call one travel mode and the other one combat It's a mode. flight sim in its own right. The rivals like <clears throat> Microsoft Flight. And I want to see that aspect of it. I don't mind sims. They're okay. All those keybinds, but I mean, like, I don't know. I'm sure if you keep doing it, it probably becomes second nature. Uh... Oh, hardcore aiming. 
Poor guy. Combat mode is SCM or standard combat maneuvering. Nav mode is navigation mode. The first mode, SCM, this is a mode where you can shoot your guns, missiles, use decoys to avoid missiles, and chaff to cloud sensors in the area. But even in space, you're limited to about 225 without boost, 500 with boost. In navigation mode, you can freely travel up to 1425 meters a second in this ship. However, even in navigation mode, atmosphere is gonna naturally slow you down. The closer you are to space, the faster you can go. But nav mode, your shields will go down. You cannot use your weapons, missiles, or countermeasures. So remember, hold B to switch these because you'll need them if you ever want to get out of combat. Next, let's talk about middle left because that is important for combat as well. You have your speed limiter and you can scroll up and down to limit the amount of speed that you can go in nav mode or combat mode. If you're in combat, make sure you're scrolling this all the way up because nothing feels worse than needing to run away and being blown up because your speed was set too low. The middle left, you're going to have your boost capacitor. Next, bottom left, we have our landing gear. You can go ahead and toggle this within. This is important because putting your landing gear down will slow you down to a crawl. Then we have enhanced stick precision. This should always stay on. It's going to help you aim. Next, toggle coupled or decoupled with C. Decoupled just means you're going to keep the momentum. And it's for experienced pilots since it's super easy to drift into something when it's on. Next, we have VTOL or vertical takeoff and landing. You can toggle this with K. Not every ship has this, but on the ships it does, you can get some serious upward thrust when it's enabled. And finally, on the top left, we have our signature or your stealth. The higher this is, the more detectable you are. Boosting, shooting, charging your QT will all affect this. And for reference, around 3K is very stealthy. 20K is pretty high. In the middle of your screen, you have the height ladder. Basically, if you want to get to space fastest, point this up in 90 degrees and fly forward. On the bottom right, you have your altitude readout, which you'll need to get to about 11K before you can make your first quantum jump. Then hydrogen fuel for normal flying, quantum fuel for big jumps between planets. A targeting mode we can talk about later. These are your decoys and your chaff, which are your countermeasures to dodge missiles, and we'll get to these in a little bit. And staggered fire, but you don't need this for now. Finally, we have auto target. I'm going to suggest you turn this off by holding T. Personally, for space combat, I like staying on my target even if they go off my screen. With auto target on, it's going to target whatever ship is in front of you and not who you last targeted. Last, we have your ammo. Lasers will continue to recharge. Ballistics you'll have to refill if you run out. With that out of the way, let's do your first quantum jump. Like I said, you'll need to get to 11,000 meters. On the way, go ahead and switch to nav mode. Do this by holding B. Once you're in nav mode, it will automatically spool your quantum. You can press middle click to cycle through having markers, no markers, and even going into scanning mode. If you hit tab in or out of scanning mode, it will send out a scanning ping. Not only that, but it's also helpful for seeing the ground at night, flying through asteroid fields, or basically anywhere that has low visibility. If you press left alt and C while you're in coupled mode, you'll enter cruise control. And this works just like a car. Whatever your speed is at when you press left alt and C, it's going to do its best to maintain it. Just increase or decrease your speed to adjust it. But when you're done, make sure you turn it off or you will crash, you will die, and you will be sad. Now that we're way above jumping altitude, we can see Tressler in space on the right. Go ahead and press middle click to show your QT markers again. Then hold mouse one to initiate the jump. But what if our destination is too far away? Well, you can use F2 to open the star map. You can use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out and double click on points of interest to highlight them. From there, you can set route on the left. If you want to use the search bar instead, it's very helpful and it even shows your closest locations first. So let's click on Tressler. If you decide you want to go somewhere else or break away from your route, all you got to do is hit F2 and then on the right, hit cancel route. But for now, hold mouse one and go ahead and jump. On approach, use the TVI or thrust vector indicator to avoid the station. When you're close enough to the station, you can either enter combat mode, slowing you down significantly, or scroll wheel down to make sure you're not going too fast. Press left alt and in to call for landing and head to the hangar to sign you. 
When you get close, press in to get your landing gear down. Once landed, it's happen. good practice to press I, I to turn your enough. engines off but and I'm keep your shields on, especially when you're landing anywhere that is not in armistice zone. Go ahead and hold Y to get out of your seat. Awesome, you made it to Port Tressler. Here you can find the ship consoles, small food shops, the habs where you spawn in when you log in, the transit elevators that will take you to the Galleria, which has a bunch of shops for FPS gear, ship parts, and finally the cargo deck, which has a ton of gear and ship rentals. Last but not least, we have the clinic. We're going to go ahead and set our spawn here. That way, whenever you do go down and have to respawn, you don't have to ride a tram and get out of a big spaceport and take 20 minutes to get going again. You're looking for Olympus insurance consoles. Go ahead and click transfer imprint. The clinic also has helpful medical supplies. The paramed gun is probably the best of all these tools. So let's talk about respawning, healing, and ejection. Our buddy here is gonna help us show off the medical system. So if you're in combat and you're in space and there's no chance of survival, there isn't parachutes yet, but you can hold up and hit the ejection button or right alt and Y. If you're out doing your mission and your ship happens to explode, don't worry, it is not gone forever. After you respawn or make it back to the station, head to the ship console and you'll be able to reclaim here. There's also an option to expedite, but we're broke so we're not going to do that. Floating in zero-g like this, commonly known as EVA or extravehicular activity, the controls are exactly the same as FPS. Q and E is your role. Space is a sin. Left control is descend. The cool thing about the new EVA is it's fully decoupled meaning you can kind of Superman fly and still have full control of your aiming for your FPS weapons or whatever tool you're using. Next, let's test healing. If you take in too much damage, you go into a down state. You can use a med pin on someone else by tapping forward to pull it out and then right clicking when you're standing or crouching right above them. When you're down, you cannot heal yourself, but you can hold them to call for a med beacon. Ah yes, the final boss of video games, making friends. Jokes aside, to use the med gun on someone else, go ahead and right click and then hold mouse 1. If they have a tier 3, lowest, tier 2, medium, or tier 1, highest level injury, you can press middle mouse while holding F, and then click on the slider to move it from basic to advanced mode. Click auto on the bottom right, and this will give you the exact medicine they need for 5 minutes. You can do the exact thing on yourself by pressing B. Just make sure when you're done, you switch it back to the basic mode. A good rule of thumb is tier threes are not a big deal, but tiers two and tier one, it's time to head to the clinic. Just keep in mind of your medicine level. If it gets too high, you'll pass out. Once you're landed back at any station with a clinic, the consoles at the front of the clinic is where you get your room. Lay down on the bed and you can treat your injuries by pressing the treatment tab here. Next, we're talking about the Moby Glass. And this is your cell phone in Star Citizen. Tap F1 to open it up and get to your home page. On home, oh, wow. you can see current missions, invites, your crime stat level, and who runs the system you're in. In this case, it's the space government or the United Earth Empire. Next, we have your ship info, including ammo, fuel, and distance from your ship. Bottom middle is going to be your surrounding environment stats, including gravity, if it's safe to breathe without this a This is helmet, like the most complicated game I've ever seen. Radiation. On the right, we have your health status. Besides this is Eve. a more dedicated version of all your health info and will give you current information on your medicine and injuries. After that, comms is one of the most important apps in the Moby Glass. Comms, you can see your channels, including global and party chat. Under friends, you can call for landing and also to call for pickup if you're purchasing cargo from a station. Under that, you have a list of your friends who are currently on and offline. To add friends, you'll have to go to the main menu and search their name in the top right. On the right, you have a member list of whatever channel you're a part of. In this case, it's the server since I have... So this guy talks fast, and I kind of want to see how it sounds if I slow him down. <laughs> I want to see if I could do all this learning in real time and do, do this all in 40 minutes. I don't think so, but let's see how he sounds. Global selected. You could right click their name and add them here as well. Invite to party channel and even mute. Under manager, you can change your global chat to completely off, change chat color, and even mic settings. The next app is contracts. Contracts simply let you make money in Star Citizen. Most of them are pretty simple, 
and some of them should be completely avoided. Salvage is a very chill and easy way to earn money if you have a vulture or you've earned one in game. You could also ask in global if anyone is looking for an extra hand on a reclaimer. Most salvages are very friendly and very happy to show people the ropes. And a lot of them will not be afraid to share the wealth with you. Investigation can be cool, but might send you to confusing caves, so keep that in mind. Search and delivery missions, in my opinion, are a bit too finicky to recommend. Bounty hunting is PvE, except for your suspect apprehension. This will take you on a quest line to do your PvP bounty certificate. Mercenary is mostly FPS missions with sometimes flight missions. Security contract evaluation is the mission we're going to be doing first. We'll fly in, shoot some baddies, get some loot, and get paid to do it. Research is a long fetch quest that essentially has you drop a box off on the other side of the system. It's okay money if you have a fast quantum drive like a cup drop mission. It's really epic. Fits in and a lot of confusing recommend. Bounty hunting my wealth with you. Investigation can be cool, but might send you to confusing caves, so keep that in mind. Search and delivery missions, in my opinion, are a bit too finicky to recommend. Bounty hunting is PvE, except for your suspect apprehension. This will take you on a quest line to do your PvP bounty certificate. Mercenary is mostly FPS missions with sometimes flight missions. Security contract evaluation is the mission we're going to be doing first. We'll fly in, shoot some baddies, get some loot, and get paid to do it. Research is a long fetch quest that essentially has you drop a box off on the other side of the system. It's okay money if you have a fast quantum drive like a Cutlass with an XL1. But in a starter ship, I wouldn't recommend. Priority is event missions like Xenothreat, which if you're playing in May, is currently going on right now. Xenothreat is an event where basically they're mad at the space government because the aliens are stealing our jobs and they won't stand for it. Jokes aside, cool locations to look out for in the mission description is distribution centers. They are huge locations that should be really fun content for you to check out. Keep in mind, some of them have points, so if you go there without a mission, either land far away and walk in, or you might get shot down. Racing is where you can get paid to complete tracks around Stanton, but the catch is you have to get really good times to get paid, and it's not really that much. Verified missions are legal missions approved by the space government. Unverified means you're at risk of getting crime stat or going to space jail. So steer clear of them unless you want to get a bounty and have player bounty hunters after you. Offers was the mission list we just went over. Accepted is accepted missions where you can abandon, share, track, or untrack. History is failed or completed missions. And beacons are where you can pay players to do stuff mm. for you. Look at all these Next, blue trees. Next, we have the map or the star map. You can access this at any time by pressing F2. The map when you first open it up is a zoomed in version of the mini map. To get to the full oh, size wow. map, you have to zoom out with scroll wheel. And now you can see we're around Microtech. You can hold mouse one to spin around and mouse two to pan. And press four to gradually step out until you have the entire map view. If you double click a location, you can focus on it. Also, don't forget about the search bar, which is really helpful and even sorts things by your location. It will take a while to memorize locations, but once you do, this will get you anywhere in the game. When you double click or hover over a location, if you're in a ship and you tap R, you can set route from here. On the right, you'll get info like how many stops there are, how long of a jump it is, and how much fuel you're using. If you change your mind and you want to jump anywhere else freely, you can- Oh no, it, it is! It's like jumping all the time! Cancel your route on the right. Journal is where lore and the system laws live that you're- Yeah, who cares? I'll just run fucking- Yeah, like that's all it is and it's like a six minute flight or whatever. That's cool. I don't mind that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Maybe I will do this game. I think I probably will. Early in, but the journal goes mostly untouched. When I have all the money, I don't know, I can buy ships or whatever. And I'm sure there's pirates, so when I, and whenever I make money, I just buy a new ship, I guess. Assets is where a list of all your items and I wonder Star if Citizen the are. music's example, good. Is the music good? Well, if we click Microtech and then Tressler, we can see the items that we just stored here. Reputation we'll talk about in detail after our first mission. But this is where you can check out how long till your next mission upgrade, reputation bonuses, and if an organization hates or loves you, which can affect your available missions. If an org hates you, they will not give you missions. While it is I am excited to get into this game. I, th I, I kind of wish I could play it tomorrow, but I don't know. I don't really want to move money around. <laughs> it's annoying.
where you can send money to anyone in the game for a small fee. And landing is where you can repair and refuel after a mission. Just click on the services you want and wait for the messages to disappear. Vehicle Loadout Manager is where you applied your ship upgrades. This deserves its own video, but the general rule of thumb is if you're going to go buy gear, military grade A for everything except your quantum drive. Size 1, you want the Atlas from Her All 5. Size 2, you want the XL1 from Tressler. And the size 3, you want a TS2, which you can get at Orison or Cruel 5. All right, another section done. Now it's time to learn how to make money and get gear. We're going to start with our security contract evaluation. But keep in mind, each planet has its own evaluation under Mercenary. So we need to head to the Marked Data Center on Microtech. Once we get there, we need to clear out all the enemies without harming the security that's already there. And don't worry, friendlies will have a green marker above them. Speaking of which, you can accept call to arms every time you log in under Mercenary. This gets you an extra 500 AUEC for every bad guy you take down. But when you accept it, it's going to automatically track it. Make sure you're tracking your right mission and not call the arms so you see your markers. Now let's head out to Hangar 3. Once you get in your seat, tap F2 to open your map. And this one's in a bit of an awkward spot, but if you double click and set route on the yellow mission marker, it will take us straight to the place that we're supposed to go. Left all plus N is gonna call for the hangar to open. And once you're out, hold B to enter travel mode. The good news is your route is already set. So just look at the mission location, complete the calibration and hold mouse one. Some FPS missions are going to have hostile turrets. So on your way in, if you see trespassing in front of you or this icon on your minimap, that means that you need to be careful. If you get within about three kilometers of the base and it's hostile, you will be shot down if you're not careful. Fly low and land behind cover or drive a ground vehicle to avoid them. If you're not trespassing, that means it's a friendly bunker and you're fine to land. If you're flying in at nighttime, make sure to be pressing tab so you can see the outline of the ground and the horizon. Once landed, I see a to... potential for. Well, I don't know. I don't know how the feel is, but I see a potential for a really good game here. Uh, I don't know. It's it's uh, a little daunting, but I like I don't know. I I didn't think that um they would ever get to the point where the game would be have like DLSS or frame generation or anything like that. And I was like, I don't know. I don't think this game will play well with others, but I think maybe this game might play well with others. We'll see. To turn off your engines with I and keep your power and shields on. Just remember to turn your engines back on when you get in your pilot seat. Before we go in, here is a refresher. Tap 4 to bring out your first med pin. Hold 4 to select which one you want. This is helpful if you have med pins, oxy pins, maybe a hacking chip, and you want to select the right one. Tap 5 to bring up your med gun. Press B to switch to self healing. Ooh, we love that sound. That, that one was head like heavy missile uh, specialization or whatever that was. What was it? Uh, the skills, the personal plans, the personal plans, the... Oh, completed the... Or no, I just go, uh, Praxis Mastery Level 95 days. AO, DPS, 7 of skill plan completed, great plan, great plan, certified plan, skill plan, skill catalog. What was the history? What did you train? I don't know. It's all good stuff. Guided missile precision, huh? Um, yeah, it's all good stuff. I think that's a good one. We'll bump it. And we'll do high speed maneuvering next. And then, yeah, it's good. Press one and two for primary weapons or three for sidearms. Hold any of those and it will bring up your selection menu. With that out of the way, let's head downstairs. There are markers for enemies, but only when the last three enemies are left. Friendly NPCs will always have markers on them. If you tap F on a weapon, it will pick it up quickly. Tapping F on an NPC or a lootable container will bring up the new looting menu. You can use mouse one to swap or grab items quickly. You can also drag them to empty spaces or shift in mouse one will put it straight into your backpack or free inventory. Keep in mind, if you press mouse one on an item and you don't have a free slot for it, it will swap it with the other item instead. 
If you hit tab, you can swap to the armor section. The nice thing about this is if you swap armor here, the game will do its best to keep all of your items as well. So grabbing their legs, their chest, backpack, is still gonna mainly pull all of your items together. There's also ammo repulling. If you tap left alt and then one with any weapon out, it will repull all, all the these ammo terrible and any empty spaces on your belt will be filled up by magazines that are in your backpack. The more ammo and magazines you have to go through, the longer this process will take. But it's relatively quick and you can actually move while doing it. And with the last enemy down, it's mission complete. It will give you a timer to leave the area. If you don't get out in time, you will be shot and probably sent to prison. That's some hero my treatment, network huh? connection dropped. So oh yeah. The loot boxes. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. So my, I apparently I have DC'd. That's not too good. It's 3:20 in the morning. Uh, well, that's not too good. There goes all that stuff. Yeah, connection lost. Well, that's no good. like this for snipers lmgs grenade launchers and the god tier railgun yeah, these that. are the only weapons you cannot buy in the shop but you can buy ammo for any weapon at 99 percent of the ammo shops so the main thing is to loot the weapons here these boxes are good for medical and these ones are good for multi-tools and hacking chips let's head back to Tressler by searching for it on the map tap r to set route and head back and your first mission is now I'm still DC'd. I don't know what's going on. Let's see if my cell phone's DC'd. Action timed out. I'm going to restart my computer, guys. I'm terribly sorry here. I'm gonna st start, stop the video unless uh, the connection re-solidifies. Oh, yep, never mind. You're checking your, oh no, I'm online. Disconnected. Okay. Okay, so I want you to auto-connect. Okay, well, am I though? Yes, I am. Offline. security or firewall that indicates that i might need to restart so i'm going to pause this video i'm terribly sorry <laughs> 